Uh, I am from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, EPFL, a kind of Swiss MIT. There are two Swiss MIT, one in Zurich with several Nobel Prize and one in Lausanne with a wonderful campus. This is my office in the Rolex Learning Center. And uh, this is where John Kerry signed an agreement with Iran nuclear stuff a few weeks ago. We have a nice lake, a very nice lake indeed. This is our new conference center. This is my garden where I can go. <laughs> and uh, then you ask yourself, why is this guy showing tourist picture? We're not going to do EduLearn in Switzerland next year, so why is he presenting this? And I wanted to show actually our new campus. That was our old campus. Now our new campus is a bit broader. That's it. The number of this morning, we got 968,485 students registered to our MOOCs. We started the MOOCs at the beginning in 2012 with the others, and now we are close to 1 million. Lausanne is a university with 10,000 people, a small kind of elite university, and now we have almost one million. And you know that one third of them disappear after one week. They just register, they look at the video, and they say, oh, that's not for me. So these numbers are inflated, but, but still, when you talk to your minister of education, he doesn't know about social constructivism. He doesn't know about neo-behaviorism. He knows what one million means. So these numbers are very interesting, and I could spend one hour talking about these numbers. But today I want to focus on one question that, I'm, uh, that many people ask me is, Pierre, could you prove that, that this is good? Could you prove that MOOCs are good for learning? You know that the dropout rate is quite high, so can you sh tell us? So I say, yes, I can tell you the result. I've been in this field of learning technology for 30 years, and I can tell you what is the result of my research. <laughs> 35 years of educational research. <laughs> I'm from Belgium, you see? Ich ben van Belke. Okay. Um, and that's exactly what uh, the previous speaker just explained. It's not because it's a MOOC that it will be good. It's not, they're fantastic MOOCs. They're very bad MOOCs. They're fantastic teachers. They're very bad lecturers. Okay? So it's not because just you MOOCify something that you will get outstanding results. The question is, well, what is a good MOOC? What, what makes a difference? And the answer, in a nutshell, is it depends on the learning activity you, you do. So here on the top, we have the MOOCs on fluid dynamics. There we have water tanks in the basement of EPFL with real water pumps and a webcam. You can go online and move the yellow bar and you will see the flow changing. On the bottom, you have a MOOC on statics and you build a static structure and you see all the forces apply. In our MOOC on microcontrollers, you build it. You build, this is distributed all over Africa. We, we sell a 20 Swiss francs toolkit you build your microcontroller, you plug it in your computer, it's graded in Lausanne, you get the feedback. So it's about which kind of learning activity, that's the, my topic of today. Which kind of learning activity can we integrate when we scale up uh, education? That's the question. And to go there, I, I, move, I make a few steps away and I talk about my other research. Before to become professor at this uh, kind of uh, Swiss Institute of Technology. At the very beginning, I was a school teacher in Brussels with nine years old kids, okay? They are still in touch with me. They organized a party actually in, this, in the same school 25 years later. And uh, so what we do in our research is not only this online stuff. This is co-writer. That's for kids who are six years old and have problems writing. There are only six, but if you have problem writing, it's the beginning of painful life because everything will go wrong after that, mathematics, everything. So can you take these kids as early as possible and try to do something? Here, the approach is well known, learning by teaching. They have to train now to pass a test. So now write a letter, and then he makes a mistake, the kid takes the iPad, so he pretends to write a letter with his finger, or he's just synchronized. The kids take the iPad, they, they, they modify the letter, they give it back, and you see them, you know, this is a protege effect. You learn better if you train somebody to pass a test and then you want to pass the test yourself. So they, they have to train now to pass the test. They say, good job, my boy, and so on. So they're very engaged. So that's a very in, rich learning activity, learning by teaching. 
Here is another one. It's augmented reality. We teach frac um, angles in uh, elementary school. They move paper, and there is a projector that adds information. So there you have some information that has been printed, some information that has been unwritten, and some inf information that has been beamed, and we use paper as the support. Paper is a fantastic invention for teaching geometry. You can fold, you can rotate, you can do many things. And here is another one, vocational education. It was mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, when the kids are 16, two-thirds of them learn a job. They do an apprenticeship. Okay? And the boss of UBS, the one of the largest banks, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, many people, this is a serious uh, training. Carpenters, plumbers, most people do this dual training in Switzerland, four days per week in a company, one day per week at school, unemployment, 3%. So it's a system that works quite well, but not perfectly. This guy, for instance, they are called logistic assistant. While they work in a company and in a warehouse and they move boxes. They drive a forklift and they move boxes as fast as possible. And they're supposed to learn logistics. For instance, a product I sell every day should be close to the trucks. A product I sell once per month should be in the back of the warehouse. This kind of thing they're supposed to learn. We visited 10 companies. No, they move boxes as fast as possible. Then logistics is for the boss. They are, you know, they are the slaves. They have to move boxes. So how can you teach a nice challenge for the school teacher? How can you teach logistics to these strong guys? Okay? They hate mathematics. They hate physics. And then you have to teach logistics. So this is where we use augmented reality again. They take plastic shelves. They put the plastic shelf on the table, and they build the warehouse together on the table physically by touching and manipulating. And uh, here is how it looks like. So this is the lamp that will project information on the table. The teacher starts the activity by placing this act activity sheet on a table, and this is my warehouse. The trucks arrive there, they leave from there, and the, the, the lamp project information, like here, the, the shelf was too close to, to, for the forklift to turn. On the left, it projects information that is relevant to the activity, to this specific exercise. And once you are ready, you can run the simulation. You see the forklift, they take the box in the trucks and they bring the box to the shelf. Here you have the average time it takes to move a box from the shelf to the truck. Then we have a lot of other uh, learning activities during that curriculum, or to load the truck in, in the proper way, depending on the order of delivery and the center of gravity. The levels low. And stock management. Stock management is the most difficult for them. OK, cool. The kids, they, they like it. Okay? They, they, they are engaged, they manipulate, they manipulate. And the teachers love it. It's not always the case. Huh? The teachers like this technology. The teachers say, well, we just manage to explain things that are difficult to explain to them. So we did experiment and experiment. We go to school. We did experiment, pre-test, post-test. What do they learn? We do a tough job. Huh? They don't learn. Cool, engaging, motivating, everything, you know. And why they don't learn? Because they play. Sorry, playing is not enough. You can play for ages without learning anything. At some point, somebody has to stop you and to say, why? So, so we had this, this, this data here. You see the worst group on the left. The red column is manipulation. And the green column is discussing what they do. On the right, we have the other way around. The best group, they discuss before to run the simulation. Otherwise, they move the shelf, they run, they move the shelf, they run, they move the shelf. So how can you help these kids not only engage, but also stepping back? It's always, learning is always about heads in, heads out. So how do we have teachers who say, OK, stop. 
let's predict what you will do. For that, we give the teacher a small paper card. He has this card in his pocket. He passes in front of the table. He shows the cards, and they cannot run the simulation. They have to call the teacher. Sir, can we run the simulation? We are ready. So the teacher will come and say, uh -huh. do you think it will be faster than what you have done before? The simulation? Uh, 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 teenager. Uh, uh, we don't know. I'll think about it. And call me when you know. So the teacher goes away. Sir, sir, yeah? It will be faster, sir. OK. Why? Uh, <laughs> think about it. And, and then call me. So we give this orchestration car to the teacher. What we design is a technology that spoiled the life of the teacher because it was more interesting than the teacher. And I have seen in the proceeding that many of you design things for iPads. OK? That's not easy when you are a teacher. If you give 20, kids to the, 20 iPads to the kids, you will put the teacher in a difficult situation. Huh? The iPads are more interesting. Les enfants, please. Les enfants. Deux minutes. Please. If you do that, if the teacher has to do that three times per lesson, he spends 20% of the lesson time just trying to get. So you have to give tools to the teacher to be able to manage the classroom. Okay? Because otherwise, they will play. But you need a powerful teacher to say, stop. Predict, explain. Predict, explain. And if you're not, we, had, we needed to empower the teacher to, with a simple card to allow him to do this. So we call that orchestration. The real ma the management of, of the classroom, but not only the discipline, but also time management, the practical thing. And paper is a fantastic invention again. So the two teachers have the card in his pocket. And you notice that for starting the activity, there is no login. I hate login. Why should kids login? You know, if you say, please log in, then uh, Pierre has forgotten his, word, his password, Natasha has the capsule key which is done, so she does. It takes five minutes. Five minutes is 10% of the lesson time. How can we sp spoil 5% of the lesson time for something useless like a login? So instead of a login, you put the sh sheet of paper, there is no HTTP slash something, it just runs. So orchestration is about optimizing. Uh, the management, it's not about the activity per se, it's how do you manage as a teacher these 20 kids and 20 iPads and manage time, manage discipline, and manage learning. So this is, for instance, a tool for helping orchestration. We try to compute the um, attention of a classroom by placing two cameras, we try to compute. The good teachers are always scanning the enemy, trying to see who is with them, who is not with them. Okay? The bad teachers, they only look the first row, the, the kids who do that. Okay? So here is a technology that when it will be ready, my phone will vibrate if I, if I, have, only, if I have less than 20 percent attention in my class. Okay? So that's not a pedagogy, a, a learning story, it's a mat management of the class. So that was the first part of my tool, and, and then I tried to connect back to the MOOC. I said, we want to integrate these rich learning activities in a MOOC. Can we do it now, not with 20 people, but with 20,000? So let me take an example. Imagine you make a MOOC on geology. You are a teacher, you say to your kids, or, sorry, to your participants, please take three pictures of soil erosion around your house. So you, if you have, I don't know, if you have uh, 20,000 uh, participants, they will upload 60,000 pictures, okay? Half of them are black picture or porn picture, or you know, they make jokes, or you filter them out and you are left with 30,000 pictures, which is completely useless what you will do as a teacher if you receive 30,000 pictures. Spend all your holidays watching them? No. So, but you have 20,000 students online, so you have the solution, crowdsourcing. So you take two pictures randomly, you send them to Bill, you say which one is erosion type A, erosion type B, and which one is the best. Okay? So you repeat that with all pictures, and at the end, you have three stacks. The erosion type A, erosion type B, and those were unclear that you will forget. And since you ask them which one is the best, you can extract automatically with your algorithm the five-person best pictures, and you get, without any effort, that's for lazy teachers, without any effort, you get 1,000 very high quality, the five-person best, high quality picture of erosion. So MOOCs are not only for broadcasting, MOOCs are also for data collection, for bringing information bottom-up. Cool. Well, how can you do that? So these are the activities that I mentioned. And uh, uh, so classify picture, compare picture, and so on. You can put them 
in, in a time sequence, and you can um, distribute them on three planes, three social planes. This comes from Vygotsky. You have the individual intrapsychological plane, it's individual reasoning. You have the team activity, intrapsychological plane from Vygotsky, and then the class plane, the social plane. Okay, so you can model this little scenario as individual group and class of activity. Okay, now uh, in most pedagogical scenarios, there are three more planes. Periphery is when you have an activity with um, another class or with the parents, with people who have a login in the system. The community is when you bring in, I don't know, the butcher who will come and give a talk to your students or the museum guide or whatever, people from outside the, 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 the the school and the rest of the world. So you can describe a pedagogical scenario like that by a sequence of activities on these six planes. Now, in the example, the geology example that I gave you, there were two things which are not learning activities, which were these bits of algorithm that will classify or eliminate picture. So in this orchestration graph, there are not only the activities, but on the edges between the activity, there are bits of operators that can aggregate data, distribute data, compare data. Uh, we call that a workflow. Workflow is not a nice concept. It comes from the insurance uh, world. But it's a way to organize data from one activity. The, out the output of an activity is processed and becomes the input of the next activity. So that's what I meant by orchestration graph. A graph is defined by a set of edges and set of vertices. In the edges, you have... Um, a certain number of parameters that will allow me to go further. I will now describe the semantics, the mechanics, and the stochastics of this graph. So basically, a graph is a set of activities, and the edge have different parameters associated to the edge. The first one is what is the relationship between two activities? Why is A necessary before, necessary before B? And the first, here you have... Uh, 24 or 28, I don't know, example of relationship between two learning activities. The basic one is A is prerequisite to B. Uh, another one is A is an advanced organizer, Ozubel, for, for B. Another one is that A is just the logistic of B. Before to do B, I need to move the, the, move the table from a logistic activity. Um, the, we can do the other way around. B may be just a synthesis of A. Um, translation, we, in activity A, we show with some mode of visual representation, like histogram, and in B, we change the representation. We know that learning increases if we use multiple modes of representation. So we take activity A, we repeat it with the different modes. So in this graph, I showed you one example, but actually the, the edges can store a lot of pedagogical ideas. And then, as I said, these edges also embed an operator, a workflow operator. Like in many of our graphs, we have things like you take the answer in activity one and you make automatically groups of people who disagree. You make pairs of students who disagree. So this is a simple operator called uh, group formation. Um, another simple operator is that all my students play with a simulation. I want to aggregate to a data, all the data, all the results obtained in a simulation, and draw a curve with all the results of my students. So these operators, they take the output of an activity and generate the input of the next activity. And you see we can invent with all these uh, pedagogical ideas combined with all these operators, we can invent a broad set of um, pedagogical approaches. Now, next step is the stochastic. So let's imagine that I have these activities A1, A2. And um, X is the state of the learner at the end of an activity. So, and imagine that this state could be four values. The, state, the learner could be fine, could be active, could be lost, or could be completely dropped, okay? It's a very naive way to describe the state of the learner. Actually, if you look at literature on education, there is a rich set of words to describe the uh, cognitive state of the learner. Okay. But to, for the sake of simplicity, I will use only these, uh, these four steps, these four states, possible states. So if I take this graph, 
I, if I take the state of the learner before activity two and after activity two, I have the transition graph. Which percentage of learner move from lost to active, from active to find, to find from lost, and what is the probability of moving from one state to the other? So this graph can describe the transition, the, the path of the learner. We have been talking about adaptive algorithms. Now we are getting to adaptive algorithms. What do we know about the transition from a learner to one activity, from one activity, sorry, to the next activity? This kind of uh, transition graph, for those of you who are closer to computer science, they see me coming with Markov models and so on. Uh, we can translate this graph exactly into this matrix. So here you have which percentage move from loss to loss, from loss to active, from loss to fine, and so on. And this matrix, you can compute how much certainty it has. So if I know the state in activity one, do I, how sure can I predict the state of activity two? And uh, so you can compute actually the entropy of each line, and uh, this is the H value, because this entropy depends on the number of states, and the number of states is kind of arbitrary, we normalize it, we divide by the uh, log of the number of states, and then we compute the average. What does it mean? The average entropy is how much uncertain I am when I know the state of, of John and activity one, how much am I uncertain about the state in activity two? Okay. So a strong link in this graph, a strong edges, is an edge with a low uncertainty. This is why we make one minus, should be a minus, one minus this normalized entropy. So this, this data allows us to, to view in this graph, this pedagogical graph, what is the strength of an edge? An edge is very strong and difficult to modify if knowing the state at level, at activity one you predict. Okay, you can do the same with um, the diagnosis of the, of the students. So imagine at the time zero, I have a maximum entropy, one. I have no clue about the state of the learner. Then the learner will do something. If you watch a video, for instance, and makes many polls, you have the probability of the four states. This vector with four probability is the probability of the four states of the learner. Well, what does it mean if a learner watches a video and makes many poses? He's lost, he has to pause the video all the time, or he takes notes, so he posts for taking notes, or he likes beer. So every two minutes, you drink a beer, and it's why you pause the video. So it does not reduce the entropy, your uncertainty. It's difficult to interpret the number of poses in a video. We have some research on that. If you answer a quiz, you have a bit lower entropy, but not much. If the student tells you, sir, there is a mistake on your slide, then your entropy falls down completely. You're happy. This guy is completely with you. There is no doubt about it. So in this... The reason why I bring this graph is you can describe this classroom, the evolution of this classroom, in a rather uh, formal way, which with three dimensions. We've seen the first dimension, the history. I don't know if you see this cube. So knowing the state of, of let's say, A, Anthony, knowing the state of Anthony of, at activity I minus one, how can I predict the state of Anthony at this current activity? That's the horizontal axis. That's the transition matrix I showed you. Two. Knowing the state of the behavior of Anthony at the current activity, can I predict his states? That's the diagnosis entropy I just showed you. And there is a third one. Remember that on the graph, the vertical axis is the social axis. Knowing the state of Beatrice at this activity, can I predict the state of Anthony? Well, probably not. But if I have no information about his history, about the diagnosis, maybe I can reason in that way. If Anthony was two sigma above, Beatri above Beatrice in the previous activity, there are unfortunately good chances that he's still two sigma above at the current activity. So what is this, this? I started by a gadget talk, and I ended up with a more mathematical talk. My idea is that this, this, this orchestration is, is not just a, um, a talent of the teacher. We can model quite formally, mathematically, the process of managing these activities. I'm a school teacher, but still I believe education is, is some kind of computer, computational science. We explore a space of state of knowledge and how to navigate in these states of knowledge. And uh, that's the topic of my new book, or first book actually, Orchestration Graph, that came out uh, last week. And 
Today I make a special price for the Greek people. You can pay in drachma. <laughs> and uh, since the mayor of Barcelona is a very close friend of uh, the new president of the uh, first minister of uh, Greece, uh, the people from Catalonia can also pay in pesetas. <laughs> Thank you very much.